This is my grandmother, Naomi. We call her Nani for short. And this was her husband, my grandfather, A.D. And this was his brother, Martin Luther King Jr. Everybody knows him. One thing that we all know about Martin Luther King is that he changed the world. He ended up paying for that with his life in 1968 as a result of an assassin's bullet. What most people don't know is that his brother, A.D. King, was also part of the civil rights movement and was murdered one year after Martin Luther King. Their sacrifices left many loved ones behind, including my grandmother, Nani. She has witnessed the consequences of violence, hatred, heartache. How does one overcome and live a life after such tragedies? Well, she will tell you. The bottom line is ML preached and and, and more than make it clear that you must love everybody. You must do the right thing. He and A.D. preached that I want to do the right thing. And now, and my walker's life is trying my best to follow in their footsteps, preaching love, forgiveness, because I think in my heart of hearts, the Lord will be pleased. It was that size already. It was that size. Okay. I don't know how to make hash browns like you know. Clear, clear will call it Mo Bassett. Oh, Lord. Mo Bassett. Look at Mo Bassett. <laughs> Who was the King family? Where did this legacy start? Who raised MLK and AD and their sister Christine? Alberta Williams King, i.e. Mama King, Martin Luther King Sr., i.e. Daddy King, had three children. Willie Christine King Ferris, oldest of the three. Martin Luther King Jr., middle child of the three. Alfred Daniel Williams King Sr., the youngest of the three. My grandfather, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., has always been a champion in the King family legacy. And the reason I call it the King family legacy, you had uh, two families come together. Daddy King's grandfather, Nathan Branham King, came from Ireland, County Cork. Mama King's people were freed, emancipated slaves. So you had two freedom-fighting bloodlines come together in marriage. So Daddy King came from Stockbridge, Georgia. He came to Atlanta, Georgia with his shoes slung over his back. He had one pair of shoes. And he didn't want to walk around with shoes with holes in them, so he walked to Atlanta barefoot. 
He married, finally, Alberta King, who came from an up-to-do middle-class family. And so with that marriage, the two of them birthed their children, Martin Luther King Jr. being the most famous, Christine King Ferris, and then my dad, Reverend A.D. King. So Daddy King always had destiny, always had purpose, ain't I a man? He knew exactly what he was. He taught his sons out of the scripture, Acts 17, 26, of one blood, God made all people. So his children and subsequently grandchildren on into the next generations understood that there was one blood and one human race. Uh, my, my mother and I moved to Atlanta when I was about four or five years old to live with her brother. And that's my beautiful mother. That's wow. it. That's my beautiful mother. Because I'm an only child. My mother uh, was a single parent and a domestic engineer. And she was amazing. She was the type of mother who sheltered me, who loved me, and protected me. We called her, we called her mother Big Mom, Big Mom Bessie. Brought up uh, by primarily a, uh, a, uh, a cook. The most fascinating part about those years, my mother has always been beautifully dressed and she knows all of the etiquette and all of that. She learned that while her mother was cooking in a kitchen and doing housework, but mother grew up with the little girl of the family. She even had the clothes that were handed down from the little girl who didn't wear them all very often. It's always amazing. First, you were so, you're still beautiful, but you were just so beautiful when you were, you know, younger and you're prime. What does that mean to you? When you when you see yourself here, what do you think about? Oh, that's easy. Uh, I was only uh, 16 years, years old when that picture wow. was taken. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason that picture is I think about that, my, my husband, uh, no, 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 my boyfriend at that time, mm -hmm gave me a sweet 16 birthday party and he wanted a picture of me so I went and had this picture made and gave it to him and my boyfriend at the time for a party. Okay, who was your boyfriend? The one and only, the Reverend A.D. Oh. Williams King. Well, he was doing something right, you know, <laughs> looking, looking pretty like that. He was doing something right. <laughs> By all accounts, my mother was going to Ebenezer Baptist Church. The pastor was Reverend Martin Luther King, Sr. Mama King, Alberta King, was the music director. And mother was being raised in the church. Her mother thought it was very important. So the youngest child, the son, A.D., saw this pretty young lady. And as she was growing up, he was watching her. And they would have socials. And at some of the socials, they had a little dancing and that type of thing. So daddy watched mother for a long time before he ever spoke to her in the manner of saying, I think you might be the one. I met him when I was like 12 and he was 13 at a YWCA party. Well, when I met A.D. as we called him, at first glance, I thought he was cute. I thought he was educated. I think he was smart. And he treated me like a queen. 
In Mother's accounts, when she talks about Daddy, she watched him from a distance and then closer and closer. She was not necessarily so impressed because Mama was pretty. All the guys liked Mama. And so she was not thinking about a boyfriend or getting married. She wanted to grow up, go to college, and help her mother because her mother had been so kind to her. So she didn't even think of A.D. as a boyfriend so much. Daddy, of course, advanced his courtship and he was successful. So she began to see A.D. in a different light. And they were in high school. They became high school seniors. Mother was admitted to Spelman College. And at that time, she and A.D. by then were courting. And so they had a courtship, of course. I think the most interesting part of their courtship, in those old days, you didn't date. Dating was for one man and one woman who were married, and they went on dates together, and there was physical intimacy. So that was dating, but mother and daddy courted. While they were courting, her mother, Mama Kig, says, well, I'll let you go on a date with A.D. because he's saying that you are going to get married when you get out of school. So the physical intimacy came a little bit too early, and so I was conceived. So Mama and Daddy married before they graduated from college. And that's when I married Boaz. In scripture, the Moabite woman Ruth was shown compassion and love by Boaz. My grandfather A.D was my grandmother's real life Boaz. That's what she's always said about him. I was born January 22nd, and then came my brother Alfred, my brother Derek, my sister Darlene, and my brother Vernon. So in their years, it was a wonderful courtship and marriage, and mother always has called my daddy her Boaz. In the Bible, there's a beautiful Bible account of a romance between a man, Boaz, and his wife, Ruth. Ruth had a mother-in-law, Naomi. And interestingly enough, my mother's mother named her Naomi Ruth Barber. And so mom, being a Ruth kind of a person, she adopted or came into the faith of her family when she married we became her, the King family legacy became her family. So mother was a Ruth who uh, left everything and came into a legacy. And so her husband, A.D., became her Boaz or her kinsman redeemer. I never knew my father because my mother never ever talked about him so that uh, when I married into the King family, I can remember so many special things about uh, Daddy King, which made him so special to me, and following like a father figure, like like uh, to to me, uh, I can remember uh, very well when we were uh, after AD and I were married. We lived in the home of Daddy King and Mama King for a while, and we always had conversations. And so I was talking to myself one time because I always say what's on my mind, I do that. And I was said, Daddy, I said, Reverend King, I said, I don't know what to call you or how to, you know, respond to you. And Daddy King had a big voice when he spoke, everybody could hear it and turn around and give him contention. I said, I, I don't know what to call you. And he had a way that he could point his finger and look into you. And he said, listen, baby. He said, let me tell you something. He said, you call me dad because I'll be better to you than your own father would have been. So my chest went swelling up like that. And so having said that and having uh, A.D., uh, my boys, as you will, you know, having said that, I became uh, like a daughter into the family. In 1955, the Civil Rights Movement was set into motion 
when Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Following that, my great uncle, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., organized a bus boycott in the community. They came from Los Angeles and San Francisco, or about the distance from Moscow to Bombay. They came from Cleveland, from Chicago, or about the distance from Buenos Aires to Rio de Janeiro. They came from Jackson, Mississippi, from Birmingham, Alabama, or about the distance from Johannesburg to Dar es Salaam. By the end of August 1963, in some places of the United States, a Negro could not go to school where he chose, eat where he wished, build his home where it pleased him, or find jobs for which he was qualified. He had been insulted, beaten, jailed, drenched with water, chased by dogs. But he was coming to Washington, he said, to swallow up hatred and love, to overcome violence by peaceful protest. One of my favorite accounts of my mother, and she talks about it during this, the Civil Rights Movement, when Rosa Parks made a decision to not give up her seat on the bus, and so we know that became history, and she and Uncle Mel, the movement started. So back in Atlanta, Mother decided to test that. And so she was on the bus, and she moved to get into a seat in the front. And the bus driver pulled out a crowbar and said, if you don't get up out of that seat, I will bash your brains in. Mother really was ready to stay there. And she said the only thing that stopped her was the fact that Daddy's already out on the front lines. Uncle Emil, of course, and if she were not there, who was going to take care of the children? So she decided not to go to the back, but to get off of the bus, and she did that. In 1960, Emil, as we called him, began to organize sit-ins throughout the country. His brother, my grandfather, A.D., joined him for a lunch sit-in that ended with them both being arrested. That arrest wasn't the first and definitely wasn't the last for them. Loving father to five children, college, college degree, seminary degree, pastored four churches, very active in the civil rights movement. He was on the front end of making sure that a federal law hit the books that affected to this day how people can live in America. The law was created that was created was uh, associated with what's called open housing. In the 60s, the law of the land was white folks live where they live, black folks live where they were permitted to live. I don't care who you are, how you look, what your gender is in America, wherever you can afford to live, you can you have that right. And A.D. King was on the front end of making sure that that is a reality in America. We're almost there. All right, just pass them back. All right, I'll start on this side. Uh, was, there was an incident in Birmingham. Uh, I rode with him to the bus station. Now, we talking segregation. Well, we're in the bus station, and back then they had the, uh, the colored and, and white demarcations. We went to the bus station. I rode with him to the bus station to pick somebody up. And... Uh, there was a rail that went straight down the middle of the lobby. One side was colored, one side was white. I got thirsty. And the colored the water fountain was corroded. The porcelain had all the stains on it, the rust stains. And then I looked over at the white water fountain, and it was pristine. And this was the only time in my life that I saw my daddy commitment to nonviolence get 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 tested. I went over to the white water fountain. 
I was like, say it was pristine. I, I'm looking at the color water fountain. I don't want to drink out that, that that thing or something might be wrong with the water. And this big old tall uh, white uh, uh, white uh, law enforcement officer. I'm drinking water, and he grabbed me by the collar and snatched me off the water fountain. And say, little nigga, can't you read? My dad is jetted over there. And say, get your hand off my child. Oh, uh, if you put your hand back on him, expletive, gonna, uh, expletive, gonna happen. At the only time I ever saw my dad, my daddy, out of out of character, nonviolence. But uh, he was not necessarily indifferent to his brother. He was just who he was. But both of them had a problem with racism, discrimination, segregation. Everybody has a story to tell. And if you don't tell your story, it may never, ever get told. And I can tell you so many stories right now that it would probably bore you and you would want me to shut up, but I'll just tell you a few. Uh, my, uh, my husband, my Boaz, if you will, the Reverend A.D. Williams King, and our five beautiful children lived in Birmingham there because um, of, of his involvement and, and his being an icon in his own right and doing what he does the most of the best. I guess it was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the evening and I was seated in the living room of my home. And so after decorating uh, my uh, house, my decorating my dining room table for dinner, uh, which would be uh, the Sunday coming up, which would be Mother's Day. And after I had finished uh, decorating that, I went into the living room of my home and I was seated on the sofa. God would have it, uh, because my husband was in the bedroom preparing uh, his sermon for that, and he was a gospel preacher. And when uh, and our five beautiful children were in that room, and I don't know whether they were asleep or not, but uh, God would have it that uh, my husband would come up to the living room where I was, and he walked over uh, to the front door. He opened it, and he looked up and down the street, and uh, it was just like dark and so quiet that you could hear a cotton ball fall on the sofa, uh, on the floor, fall on the floor. So he walked over to me, and he took my hand, and he said, now, well, let's get out of here. He says, it's too quiet in here. And I said, yeah, it is quiet. So as we left my living room and got to the center of, of my home, I had noticed that my picture wouldn't had begun to crack. And uh, as we were walking away from the cracked window and uh, what I did not know was when that went to crack, that was bomb number one. And by the time we got to the center of the home, bomb two went off. And you know what? Uh, we escaped through the back door without any injuries. And so as we climbed, got uh, over the fence and whatever and walked up to the center of the home, a crowd had begun to gather 
And when the first police officer uh, was walking up to uh, walking up to from the house, and I went right behind him, and I said, "Are you going into the house?" And he was red as a beet, and he didn't say nothing. And I said, "Are you going into the house?" He still didn't say anything to me. I said, "Well, I said I'm right behind you, but if anything happens to..." Me, I said, you know, uh, you will be responsible. So he still didn't say anything to me. So as we got into the dining room, he was kicking debris one way, and I was, I said, well, I kick too. So I start kicking debris too. So as we got to the dining room there, and where my buffet was, uh, you know, uh, that was debris and everything, you know, way uh, in there. And so when I got to the plate with Jesus' face on it, I looked down and it was in pieces. So I got what I could get from those pieces. And, and I would uh, say it immediately, I said, oh my God, look what they've done to you. I said, that is now, and so it made me teary eyes for a little bit. So I would have you know in telling you this, that that plate now hangs in the bedroom of my home. And uh, it is a source of inspiration to me. So the bottom line is, is that I would have you all know when I looked at uh, all of that debris, and then when I looked and thought about that picture of, of Jesus, I, I said, you know, thank you, God. I said, none of us were hurt, and all is well. And since I am a praying person, all right, I have my God, Jesus, Lord, and all this, my inspiration and as I said uh, the picture now hangs in my bedroom and so as a result of the bomber all is well in the story all of the debris was down on the floor when I got to this picture of Jesus, as you can see, the missing pieces. That's the uh, plate that I turned over, and I was able to piece this pieces myself with uh, nail polish and up so that uh, uh, I could remember, you know, all right. So that's when, as I stood there and I was uh, expressing my sympathy, you know, it was like if. Fear not, for I'm with you always. First thing I tell anybody, when you see uh, images of a uh, explosion on television, especially a structural explosion on television, that's controlled. The real thing, nothing like what you, you see on TV in my experience. Uh, I don't remember what time the uh, house was bombed. I know I was in the bed. My brother was in the bed. My baby brother was in the bed. And since the explosion, I did some research. Uh, what causes the damage in an explosion is not the initial explosion. It's called the concussion, the energy that comes behind. Um, what we were told that ultimately whoever planted the planted the bomb 
planted it where the concussion went away from the house. Left a big old crater out in, in the ground. But the bomb was so so powerful if the concussion had of come toward the house, the house would have got leveled. What we experienced um, through, through me and my baby brother out the bed and slammed us up against the wall. Uh, simultaneously, debris flew by the bedroom door. And it's a blessing to still be alive behind that thing, cause it could, it could, if they had to turn it the right way, the house would have got leveled. That's what, that's from my research. But like I say, it ain't nothing more like what you see on TV. When our home was bombed in Birmingham, Alabama, the night before Mother's Day in 1963, now mom tells it differently. I believe when the house was bombed and the front of the house blew up and everything. I remember, I thought daddy had her in his arms. She says he pulled her by her hand. So that part of it is just a child's memory. But one memory stands out in my heart and in my mind. When we got outside and there was a crowd and the people were angry and they were frustrated. They were throwing rocks, wanting to turn the cars over. I know that some of those people who were doing that were what we called outside agitators, people who had been brought in to throw firebombs and to stir the crowd up. I'm very sure that that was happening. However, I remember my dad getting on top of a car, and I don't remember if he had a bullhorn or not, but his voice, I remember him saying, don't riot. Don't destroy. If you have to hit someone, hit me. But I'd rather you go home and pray. My family and I are okay. I remember Daddy on that car. I may be paraphrasing his words a little tiny bit, but I remember him saying, if you, wanna, if you have to hit somebody, hit me. But I would rather you go home and pray. My family and I are okay. And believe it or not, the people who lived in the community actually quieted down and began to go home. And that way, the agitators were exposed. My great uncle, ML, and my grandfather, AD, had a very close bond as brothers. ML was a little older, but they were raised together. And one of the things in my family that was um, really taught to all of us, including them back then, was that all of us can make an impact in the world. We could make a better, a better place in our community. And at the same time, we have a, a self-assuredness that no one is better than us, but no one, uh, but we're no better than anyone else. You know, we're all interconnected. There's always a difference that all of us can make. And it's, it's really interesting for me, looking back on history, to see the amount of impact they were able to have in the community and the world in a very short period of time. Neither of these men really lived into their 40s. You know, they both died very young, but both had tremendous impacts on their, um, their community and, and the world. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite, and Russ Hodge in Memphis, Tennessee, Dan Rather in New York, Bernard Kalb in Saigon, Marvin Kalb in Wellington, New Zealand, and Bert Quint in Khe Sanh, South Vietnam. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all-points bulletin for a well-dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Officers all Yeah. Uh -huh. 
requested that. My father, Reverend Alfred Daniel Williams King, was strong and smart, intellectual. When his brother was killed, he grieved deeply. Uh, he would drink sometimes, he'd drink alcohol. And that, that's kind of a thing that in the King family, because it's my understanding that my grandfather's daddy and grandfather had challenges with drink. So Daddy King himself was a kind of a, what you call a teetotaler, he abstained. Sometimes he would drink uh, the little uh, alcohols on the airplane, but instead of drinking them, he would bring them home, you know, and he would store them and keep them. So I do not hide the fact that my dad had challenges with alcohol. I've had challenges with alcohol myself. So as a result, I kind of say, nah, I don't think so. So even considering that, considering his deep grief when my uncle was assassinated, I remember when my uncle was assassinated and daddy was about to go and get the body with Aunt Coretta. He stopped with us and I was in the kitchen. I was so upset, I was so angry. I was so militant as a young woman and I wanted to blame somebody for killing my uncle. And I remember daddy standing there, I hate white people, daddy, I hate white people. They killed Uncle ML. Daddy put his arms around me, started to rock me. I just remember that he stood in that kitchen rocking me. He said, Alvita, we cannot hate white people. White people live with us. White people pray with us. White people go to jail with us. White people die with us. White people did not kill my brother. They didn't kill your uncle, Emil. The devil did. We have to learn to forgive. That was a hard lesson, and it took a little while for it to really sink in over the years. And my mother would teach forgiveness as well. Mama, daddy, I could remember them up until the time he died when the house was bombed, for example, and Mother's account of that is more beautiful than any account I could give. But I remember that they would be on their knees in their bedroom, you walk by their room, and they'd be there together praying. They would pray, they would pray. So my daddy was prayerful, he was colorful, he was exciting, he loved the Bible, he loved Jesus. So even in his weakest moments, mm. I get a little bit emotional when I think about it. But in his weakest moments, he uh, would always turn to God, always. My husband, it was reported and said that um, my husband, my Boaz, if you will, first of all, the report was out is that he drowned in our home swimming pool. My first thought was, I said, uh, I got to go straight to the marcher. I don't believe this. I said, I don't believe that. So when I got to the mortuary and I told uh, the attendants that I wanted to see him, uh, his body, I said, now that ain't gonna work. I said, you take me to uh, his body now because I want to look at him. I want to see for myself. I said, I just don't believe he drowned. I said, I don't believe. So I said, I have to see him now, just like he is, so that when uh, I got in the room and looked at A.D.'s body, uh, he had bruises across his forehead, he had rings around his neck, and he had scratches and bruises all up on his chest area, and I said, my God, I said, Eddie didn't drown. I said, he was killed. So how does one drown when you have bruises across the head, you have scratches around your neck, you have bruises on the ground? I said, no way. I said, there's no way A.D. drowned. I said, A.D. was killed. The only thing that I would want, anything I would want was to bring 
my beloved husband back to me and life because I love the ground that the Rabbi A.D. Williams came walked on. It was a uh, Sunday uh, about 10.30 or 11 o'clock in the day doing the church worship service. Where Mama King was playing the organ, they had to lower the organ because Mama King had been shot. And I'm told that Marcus Wainstein, the shooter, wanted to get Dr. King, Daddy King, when Daddy King so he didn't see Doc, Daddy King and didn't get nobody, so he took it out on Mama King. And as I looked back on, at Mama King on the stretcher and kept my eyes on her, I just could not believe what I was seeing. And I was like uh, speechless so that she placed her hand on her left cheek and she moaned the one time and shook her head. And I said, I don't believe this. I don't believe what I'm saying. Mama King was a second mother to me. I said, my God, my God. I said, you have taken away my mother. I mean, she rest in peace. And thank you for uh, my relationship uh, with mother. Faith is not something that you are taught. At 90 years old, well, may as well close, may as well so almost say 91, she has lost a husband at an early age, three children, um, parent, uh, parents, um, and she would tell you that um, if it were not for God and her love for Jesus, she would have quit. There are people in the household of faith who I describe as people who are like a Timex watch. Take a lick and keep on kicking. Remarkable woman and I'm blessed to be her son. My name is Bebetunde Olushegun Anabanjo. People normally call me Dr. Beb for short. In fact, that's what I prefer to be called. Most of my students call me that. Um, I am a native originally from Nigeria, which is a West African country. Uh, and I came to the United States to come to school in 1996. I am also a professor of computer science and also an activist. I've also produced a documentary entitled Reverend Eddie King Behold the Dream Brother to the Dreamer. I love humanity and that was what led me really spiritually to Mrs. Naomi King. Uh, I will not, I don't believe in coincidence, I believe in divine um, occurrence because uh, I first had a glance of Mrs. Naomi King by meeting Avida, who happens to teach at my college. I believe she was next door to me and I saw a picture on the wall of two brothers which I've never seen before and that those picture were the picture of Reverend A.D. King and um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And when I saw the amazing picture, I asked Avida who the brother was. And at that time, I did not know they were brothers. Uh, and then she introduced me 
to Mrs. Naomi King uh, by inviting me to the King Center at one of the events where I met Mrs. Naomi King. And at that point, I did ask her that I would be more interested in talking to her about her husband, which she wasn't ready at that very moment. She told me that she would not like to discuss it because it was a painful experience for her and she's lived without such intrusion for the past almost 40 years and I shall allow the death to rest in peace. But again, I felt that a story, the story of her and the story of, of Reverend A.D. King need to be told. I, persist, I, I persisted. The second event that I attended, I asked her the same question. She brushed me off. And, you know, again, at another event, she finally called me and said, okay, what do you want to talk about? Uh, can you come to my chapel? Let's pray about it. And then we can see what happened. So I went to her house. We went to the chapel. We prayed. After praying, she said, now it's clear. What's on your mind? Just tell me, and I'll be open to you. And I was so surprised at that very moment that um, she opened up to me and gave me her blessings. And I was able to interview her for about three hours about her husband, as well as uh, uh, what I would like to talk about, basically. And again, the rest is history. When I met uh, Mrs. King, I was surprised at our perseverance and our devotion to the mission. Uh, we will once a week go to different schools and she will read to the kids. She will tell us stories and the kids will listen to her and ask questions. She is always motivated by embracing those children and telling the story with the intention of motivating them to become not only an activist, but to know more about themselves and to be able to sustain uh, whatever they put their hearts to be and to be successful in life. Thank you. that you can be, and you will not only make God Almighty happy and pleased with you, and I will be pleased too. So don't stop, don't quit school, keep it up. God loves you, and so do I. During COVID, at the height of COVID, my mother was supposed to go to Israel. I say, Ma, you don't need to go right now. It's not happening. You just don't want me to go. No, Mother, just not now. You'll go, but just not right now. And I said, but Mom, suppose if you go right now, this happens as that. She says, well, I'll just die in Israel. That's okay. I said, Mom, really? So, of course, she didn't go exactly when she wanted to go, but not long after that, the way opened. And they would send me pictures. Uh, the doves and the birds would be flying around, the little animals, and she's out there enjoying that. I think she was most touched, the Sea of Galilee, and to walk those places where Jesus walked. I have one question. Because this is the first for me, and uh, there's just one concern that uh, among many that I have, uh, there is a song that says, and some of the words that says, I walk today where Jesus walked, and I am looking, uh, will we pass that? Uh, where is that? It says the walk path where Jesus walked.
she has always talked about going to Israel because she had the story that Dr. King told when he went to Israel about the Good Samaritan. And she actually wanted to witness that by herself. Not only the reason, she wants to be in the same space where Christ walked. These are the features of every Roman city. In here, you notice that I have one on. Every time you see me, you never see me without a butterfly in <laughs> and the, in the, in the air. Her great dream was to visit the land of her faith, to be baptized in the Jordan River. I still remember how joyful she was. <laughs> baptized in the same river where Christ was baptized? You could, it couldn't be better than that. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, my God, my Lord, my Savior. I am yours, and you are mine. I love you so much. And thank you for saving me and being baptized. And I will do your will forever. Amen. 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 You know, Mrs. King talks about love, and she's not faking it, she's real. And so, uh, just like Dr. King said, that um, darkness cannot take away darkness, only light can do that. And hate cannot take away hate, only love can do that. She exemplifies that. And you can see that when she was in Israel, she was carried by both the Israeli soldiers as well as the uh, Palestinian soldiers. They, at that very moment, they did not see the differences that they've been experiencing, they saw the love that has been espoused by Mrs. King, and they were able to feel it. As a woman who is in her 70s, when I see all of the violence and the tearing down statues and wanting to fight over skin color, I see it here in the 21st century. And I'll tell people, this is not my first rodeo. And the only answer is going to be God. The only answer is going to be forgiveness. The only answer is going to be prayer. And so, what well, did you see this? And they did that. I said, as far as I know, open the Bible. You can go all the way back to Genesis. And these things have been occurring. But every time the storm is calmed, it is calmed by God.
Donnie always had a fascination with butterflies. I think it's only fitting that she has been given the name, the Butterfly Queen. As we continue her legacy, may we all learn to face violence with forgiveness and grace. May we love our enemies and love each other. The King legacy lives on. And now, and my walker's life is trying my best to follow in their footsteps preaching love, forgiveness, because I thank in my heart of hearts, the Lord will be pleased.